Welcome. Welcome, everyone. And thank you for coming to our fifth Truth and Restoration Town Hall, which is the last of our Town Hall series and concludes our project for national healing. Our topic today is structural, environmental, and nuclear violence, one world or none. Please keep yourselves muted until you are called upon to speak. And please note that this session is being recorded. I am Dr. Bandy Lee, president of the World Mental Health Coalition, which is sponsoring today's event. You may recognize from the subtitle, One World or None, a famous book that Albert Einstein, H.H. H. Arnold, J.R. Oppenheimer, and others brought together exactly 75 years ago when they launched a project for our collective survival in the atomic age. It gave rise to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which sets a doomsday clock every year. We are now at 100 seconds, the closest we have been to humanity's doom since the creation of the clock in 1947. The World Mental Health Coalition, which has been dedicated to the promotion of societal mental health, now declares our era the psychological age, where a correct understanding of our own psychology and mind will be critical in determining whether humanity will perish or choose to persist. We are pleased to have the former executive director of the bulletin speak toward the end of this panel. For today's town hall, we have kept our topic broad for the purpose of keeping sight of the critical issues of our day. Structural, environmental, and nuclear violence are all intertwined in the sense that they reflect our failure as a species to cooperate for a common survival. We will try to highlight the psychological aspects of this problem, as well as solutions based on experience and wisdom. For this, an integrative approach is needed, which is why we brought together our diverse group of speakers and dialogue. Our state of collective mental health determines our ability to support shared self-rule, equitable distribution of resources, and peaceful negotiations over war. Introducing the session with me is Dr. Jeffrey Sachs, university professor at Columbia and one of the world's leading experts on sustainable development and the fight against poverty as he returns from the 26th Conference of Parties or COP26. He has through many years as special advisor to the UN Secretary General, shared our concern for reducing structural violence, such as economic inequality, and for preserving a livable planet as we consider the destruction of our own habitat to be an act of collective suicidality. Then he became a champion of our mission of alerting the world of the dangers of mentally unstable leadership when we were, whether we knew it or not, constantly at the brink of nuclear war and still are as the globe renews its nuclear arms race. Dr. Sachs has authored numerous books, including The End of Poverty, The Price of Civilization, and The Ages of Globalization, among others. Dr. Sachs' broad work makes him a perfect keynote for this event, and we are grateful to have him. Dr. Sachs? Andy, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your leadership, which has been exemplary and very brave. Uh, and uh, thanks uh, to uh, all the colleagues uh, in, in, uh, in our discussion today. Uh, we are <laughs> in, in such a mess, uh, obviously, uh, in uh, our domestic uh, affairs in the United States and also globally. Uh, I will only touch on three themes uh, to help get us started. We have such a wonderful and varied group but I want to touch on, on three themes. Uh, and with the, the Rittenhouse uh, verdict uh, again yesterday showing how awful, uh, how failed our justice system is, uh, how misguided we are, how divided we are culturally, uh, as well as politically. Uh, I'll start with reflections on, on the United States and then turn to the, the world scene. Um, I'll, I'll start with the economics. Our society is probably more divided than ever between rich and poor uh, and between super rich and, and the rest of us. Uh, Sylvia, if I could ask you to, yeah, thank you. Uh, between the super rich and the rest of us, 
six Americans uh, have uh, $1 trillion of wealth among themselves. That's bizarre. Uh, it's uh, deeply wrong. The fact that the, the one on the top thinks it's fitting to tweet uh, uh, his opposition to being taxed or uh, his uh, nastiness vis-a-vis -vis Bernie Sanders shows uh, the complete impunity uh, of uh, the super rich in our society right now, which is uh, profoundly disorienting and debilitating. We're in a battle. Uh, it's, it's not the, the end of things, but it's, uh, it's symptomatic. This Build Back Better legislation, which uh, the House passed and which has gone to the Senate, let's say is a modest step in the right direction. But the fact that it finds such opposition shows how horrible our uh, plutocracy has become in the United States. Uh, Build Back Better calls for normal, decent things that any normal uh, society has. So the things that are on the table, a little bit more on health care, a little bit more on child care, a little bit more child support, a little bit more on education. <laughs> These are things that every one of our peer countries has routinely. But in the United States, it's viewed as some great decisive battle. And if you read the Wall Street Journal, which I have to do for, for a living, it's, it's a despicable propaganda sheet uh, each day, but it exemplifies the really the white supremacist entitled plutocratic mind. Uh, this is some horrible piece of legislation that's going to produce some terrible socialism in America. So this is the battle that we're in. The rich and the powerful are so rich, so powerful, and they're laughing because they get their way on everything. And whether even this modest piece of legislation will pass the Senate remains to be seen because uh, senators who are supposed to represent their people, Senator Manchin, uh, who's the senator of the poorest state in the United States, a state that is at the bottom of life expectancy, a state that is at the bottom of educational attainment. Of course, because he's a multimillionaire in, uh, in, in working hand in hand with the lobbyists, owns, owns a, two coal companies and presides over coal regulation in the Senate Energy Committee. You can't make this stuff up, how corrupt our government is. But that's, uh, he's the decisive vote right now. So this is uh, the US scene. Let me just end on the US side by saying there's, there's only one issue in the Build Back Better really. And that is that rich people don't wanna be taxed at all in the United States, period. And so the whole fight is against modest increases of taxation of companies and of super rich individuals. And they may win in the end. Why not? They pay the Congress, uh, they fund the congressional campaigns uh, with the billions and they expect trillions in return and they get it so far. So I regard the battle over Build Back Better as nothing to do with any of the specifics, which are all completely mainstream in any, in any normal successful country. It's all about taxes on the rich. And we're in the battle of whether the rich run everything in this country or just run most things. And so we're gonna see in the next week or two what the story is. But let's raise our voices uh, everywhere and call out these corrupt politicians in the Democratic Party, not to mention the Republican Party, which is lockstep, of course, 50 votes in the Senate against doing anything decent. Let me turn briefly, Bandy, to the world scene. There are two issues I want to raise. One is the US provocations vis-a-vis -vis China, which have been now intensifying in recent years, basically because China, after 
a century and a half of outside interventions uh, began a development process more than four decades ago, has partly caught up with the uh, high technology, high income economies, and the United States has decided this is too threatening to US primacy. And so starting several years ago, the US started to pull out uh, every stop in order to try to constrain or contain China's rise. We are deluged with daily propaganda recounting every violation of human rights in China and none of our own, which are it, incre is incredible because China has not had one overseas war for more than 40 years. And that one was a brief two years of intervention in Vietnam. And the United States has been at war with millions dead during this period. And we call China the aggressor and China is not the aggressor. But the whole idea of this propaganda, which is pervasive now in our society, is that the United States uh, political structure and military elite is intent on keeping US primacy, so-called. And in, a, in an open world, the United States cannot keep its hegemonic power or its primacy without violence against other countries. And so this is actually a US provoked confrontation, blamed all on China, but we have the mainstream media saying every day, boycott the Olympics, do this, do that, uh, stand up for our allies. And it could easily get us into war, especially over Taiwan, because of the obfuscations of what used to be straightforward, proper US one China policy. So just to say that we need to be very vigilant not to not to uh, let the the nationalists and the hegemonists take us into a new devastating confrontation and taiwan would be the next flashpoint for nuclear war and when biden said completely inexplicably two weeks ago, invented a new doctrine that the US would militarily defend Taiwan. Uh, it took us another step forward. That hand of the doomsday clock moved closer to midnight with that statement, which I think he just made ad hoc, but is very dangerous. The second, and, uh, the, the second global point and the last point I wanna make, uh, Bandy, is on <laughs> what we should be doing if we weren't digging ourselves deeper into a hole both at home and abroad, what should we be doing? We should be using our technology, our know-how and our vast wealth, which at a global scale, by the way, 3000 people have $15 trillion of personal wealth. We should be using this to end poverty and hunger, stop this pandemic and address the climate crisis. Those are the things I ostensibly work on day to day in my work for the UN. The distractions of the negative sides are so huge. The costs of this battle with China made out of nowhere, the uh, divisions in the United States that have rendered the US uh, almost useless for problem solving on the world scene. This means that the positive agenda is struggling. And we saw that again in COP26 in the last two weeks. We saw it at the G20 before that. We are not putting real politics, real finance, real money behind the critical steps needed to make the world work right. As President Biden was declaring commitment to climate, and he no doubt has it. Of course, Manchin was saying, we're not gonna put the climate legislation into the Build Back Better bill. So the, the gap is absolutely extraordinary. Let me say in closing that all of the goals that the world has agreed to, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement are achievable. In other words, if you do the analytical 
uh, steps, what would it take to achieve them? They're not even very expensive, but they do require that the rich pay more taxes. They do require that the polluters be held to account. They do require that we stop our fossil fuel mania, which continues until today, even as the planet is being utterly wrecked. In other words, we have to do something. We have to actually follow through with real measures on the words that we have enunciated. If we would follow through, we could make the world a fairer, more inclusive, safer, more prosperous world for all. And it's worth keeping in mind, as negative as everything is, the world is ours to help uh, create the kind of future that we want and need. And that's why your leadership, Bandy, has been so important, keeping us pointed in the positive direction. And I'll end on the positive note. Let's get this done. Thank you very much. Thank you enormously, Jeff, for bringing such clarity, as always to these great issues of our day. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us during your busy schedule. Uh, please feel free to. Uh... So we'll now turn to our panelists. We will hear from Dr. Richard Wilkinson, Professor Emeritus of Social Epidemiology at the University of Nottingham, who is perhaps the foremost leading scholar on inequality and also co-founder of the Equality Trust. His influential book with Kate Piquette, the spirit level not only summarized vast research on inequality, but made the critical connection with societal mental health. So we're pleased to have Dr. Wilkinson. Dr. Wilkinson, speak with us. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Wilkinson is here yet. Okay. Uh, why don't we start with Dr. James Gilligan then, his good friend. Uh, Dr. James Gilligan, a forensic psychiatrist and one of the world's leading authorities on the causes and prevention of violence, who was director of Harvard Medical School's Institute of Law and Psychiatry before he transitioned to New York University. He is the author of Violence, Preventing Violence, and Why Some Politicians Are More Dangerous Than Others. He has been actively sought after by Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, the UN Secretary General, the World Health Organization, and the World Court, among many other entities. Uh, Dr. Gilligan. Well, thank you, uh, Bandy. Uh, it's an honor to me to, to uh, be on the same program with uh, a, a giant in this field, Jeffrey Sachs. And uh, I hope we'll, uh, I will also be sharing this with Richard Wilkinson, who, as you said, is also a, a, a giant in this field. What, what I would like to emphasize today is that I think we are here to discuss what I think is the most important and dangerous problem of our time. And that is that now that we are in the era of thermonuclear weapons and global climate change, and we have shown little ability to deal uh, constructively with either problem, uh, We've shown ourselves unable to prevent the uh, spread of thermonuclear weapons, even to nations led by leaders of questionable sanity, including, I would add, our own, um, or to make a significant dent in the problem of uh, global warming and climate change. Uh, we are at greater risk than we've ever been in the history of evolution of becoming the first species to render itself extinct through its own behavior rather than succumbing to changes in the environment beyond its capacity to control. Now, the problem here, as I see it, is that we need to learn to understand what the causes of violence are and what we can do to prevent it. Uh, I'm approaching uh, both uh, thermonuclear weapons and climate change as forms of violence. There's nuclear violence and there's ecological violence, both of which 
constitute forms of violence if we define violence simply as behavior that causes injury and death, including epidemics of, of death. What we uh, have, have to deal with is the fact that we not only have not adequately dealt with the causes of our behavior, um, we, we've done much too little even to understand what is causing the violent behavior that threatens all of us. Um, the National Academy of Sciences uh, some years ago studied how much research is being done on the causes of violence as opposed to other causes of death and disability like cancer and heart disease. And they put it in a graph where the amount of money spent on cancer and heart disease goes up to the top of the page and you can barely see the amount that is devoted to studies of the causes and prevention of violence. Um, I myself have devoted my life to doing what I could to learn as much as possible about those issues using prisons as my social psychological laboratory, so to speak, uh, by trying to learn from the most directly violent people our society produces, what co has caused them to commit violence and what kinds of interventions uh, facilitate their renouncing violence as, as their default form of behavior for expressing their feelings and uh, pursuing their goals. Um, what I have learned from that is that there is a necessary, though not sufficient, cause of violence in the same way that there are necessary uh, but not sufficient causes of other epidemics of death, such as tuberculosis or the current coronavirus pandemic. Um, we know that those, for those, the tubercle bacillus or the coronavirus are necessary but not sufficient to cause those illnesses and deaths. The corresponding cause of violence, I'd say, is not a microorganism. It is an emotion, the emotion of shame and humiliation. Uh, emotions that are so common and so varied that we have dozens of uh, synonyms for them, shame and humiliation, such as feeling uh, disrespected or feeling insulted or ridiculed or treated as inferior or inadequate or weak uh, uh, or any of the many forms of what psychoanalysts call narcissistic injuries or what many uh, Asian cultures call loss of face. Um, the, I have yet to talk to any man who has committed murders, and almost all of them are men, um, who hasn't revealed that the ultimate cause of his violent behavior was as a means of avoiding or undoing an experience of feeling disrespected, shamed, or humiliated. But what causes humiliation on an epidemic scale? That's where structural violence comes in. Uh, Johann Galtung, the, the uh, Scandinavian sociologist, invented uh, that term to refer to the excess deaths that the poor suffer compared with the rich in societies that use social and economic structure divides the population into rich and poor, uh, as ours does to a, a, a disproportionate degree, as, as uh, Professor Sachs was just uh, reminding us. Uh, Gandhi was certainly correct when he said that uh, the deadliest form of violence is poverty, uh, to which I would add, uh, especially relative poverty, for as uh, as Karl Marx put it, and I'm, and I'm quoting Marx here as a psychologist, not as a, uh, a political uh, advocate. M Marx pointed out that it is not living in a hovel, or in other words, a shack or a slum, that makes people feel ashamed. It's living in a hovel next to a palace. And it's when you have that kind of inequality in a society that you stimulate shame for those who are put at the bottom of the social and economic uh, status system. And that in turn produces anger and ultimately higher rates of violence. 
uh, I've been able to document uh, uh, working together with you uh, uh, in this research jointly, showing how rates of both homicide and suicide, the, the two forms of individual lethal violence, increase um, when the rate and duration of unemployment increase, when social and economic inequality increases, and when they're uh, and these are correlated with the uh, frequency, depth, and duration of recessions and depressions, uh, which disproportionately, uh, of course, damage and kill the poor. Now, the thing about structural violence is that it is not only the main cause of death, that is, far more people die from the effects of poverty than from all the violent criminals put together, and even from most wars. Um, so structural violence is the main cause of, uh, of violent death, but it is also the main cause of the uh, individual violence that we call murders and suicides. <coughs> These, uh, as I mentioned, follow when the uh, uh, rates of, of relative poverty uh, and, and social uh, inferiority increase. One important political fact that, uh, that we discovered um, in, in that research is that all three of those forms of uh, economic hardship and stress increase, have increased since we first began measuring rates of homicide and suicide on a yearly national basis starting in 1900. These forms of violent death have increased when Republicans have occupied the White House and they have decreased when Democrats have occupied the White House to a degree that is way more uh, statistically significant than could possibly be happening uh, by chance. So that I'd say that the, uh, uh, the economic uh, uh, stresses uh, clearly are, uh, I think, the socioeconomic mechanisms that account for the correlation between political party and, and violent death. Uh, um, well, let me, let me stop there. I just wanted to mention that uh, the kind of violence that we're talking about really is, can be understood uh, as part of, the, uh, of, of a dialectical uh, conflict uh, between left-wing and right-wing uh, politics in this country and around the world, where th there's a, a worldwide uh, backlash against democracy. Uh, we see that absolutely in the polarization in our own politics, and uh, we see it around the world. Let me stop there, and so we'll have time for discussion. Thank you, Jim. That was wonderful. Dr. Richard Wilkinson has joined us. He is Professor Emeritus of Social Epidemiology at the University of Nottingham, a leading scholar on inequality and co-author of The Spirit Level. Dr. Wilkinson? Um, I have uh, spent my most of my career working on the effects of inequality, bigger material differences between rich and poor, principally measured uh, by income differences. Um, I, I'm an epidemiologist, um, and uh, my focus for initially was on health inequalities, the huge differences in life expectancy between rich and poor in all our countries, which are often 10 or 20 years uh, between people in poorer areas and richer areas. Um, but I really moved on to a much deeper understanding of the effects of inequality. Um, I think most people take rather a naive view of what it does to us and think that inequality only matters if it makes people very poor or if it seems uh, incredibly unfair. Um, but actually, uh, a less naive view, a more accurate view, is that it changes the nature of our relationships. Um, it changes what appears to be human nature. Um, uh, uh, we always, every society seems to regard its social structure as if it was a direct reflection of social, uh, of human nature. But actually, of course, the way people behave, uh, what's important to them and so on, changes in different societies. 
And what we've seen now that we have good measures of inequality in different countries that allow us to make good comparisons uh, of uh, lots of different outcomes in relation to uh, levels of income inequality is that um, that old intuition that inequality is divisive and social, socially corrosive is truer than we ever expected. Um, uh, and what you see is that all the problems that are more common at the bottom of society, uh, like poorer educational performance, uh, worse health, um, more violence, all those problems become more common throughout the society. Inequality makes its biggest difference uh, to the least well-off, but even um, well-off people with good jobs, professionals, uh, well-educated and so on, would do better if they lived on the same incomes, same jobs and so on, in a more equal society. They might live a bit longer, their kids would do a bit better at school, uh, all sorts of measures um, show that we become more antisocial with more inequality. Uh, and with that goes higher levels of corruption, um, uh, a decline in, in community life, a decline in trust between people. Um, as, as I've said, more violence, one of the most well-researched uh, outcomes in relation to inequality is homicide rates. And some studies show tenfold differences in homicide rates uh, according to levels of inequality. Um, and, and it is because uh, you move from a society where reciprocity is the norm, where people feel they have shared interests, to a society where people feel uh, they're in competition with each other. Uh, if you like, uh, throughout human existence, other people have had two possibilities. Other people can be either our worst rivals, our worst threat, um, or they can be the best source of assistance, cooperation, uh, love, learning, everything else. Uh, and so uh, we find, uh, this came out of the, the health inequalities research really, that human relationships are one of the most powerful stressors affecting health. Um, so in more unequal societies, where there's much more social stress, more st stressful relationships, uh, chronic stress is worse, uh, leading to something that looks rather like more rapid aging. Um, although the main effects of inequality are, uh, we see of this kind are within societies, uh, they also exist internationally between societies. Um, with bigger income inequality, there is a tendency for people at the top to think of themselves as superior and regard people lower down in the hierarchy as inferior. Um, and there are two responses to that. We all feel more worried about how we're seen and judged by others. Um, and uh, some people uh, overcome with feelings of lack of confidence uh, um, uh, and um, uh, they, they withdraw from social relationships, finding um, social contact uh, too stressful. Other people do the opposite. You know, if you're worried about how you're seen and judged, you flaunt your uh, achievements and abilities. You probably exaggerate them, uh, find ways of bringing up your achievements and so on, and giving a good account of yourself in, in conversation. All that becomes more important. But with that uh, goes an uh, increase in, in consumerism. Uh, if you live in a more unequal uh, society or a more unequal area of the United States, uh, you're more likely to spend um, money on, on a, a flashy, extravagant car. You're more likely to buy clothes with the right designer labels. Um, the status consumption increases. Um, and of course, uh, that kind of consumerism is the most, probably one of the most important obstacles to moving towards sustainability. Uh, and people involved in 
um, campaigning on, on the environmental front, of course, want to uh, get governments to change from putting economic growth first to putting uh, well-being first, maximizing well-being. But my fear is that uh, economic growth isn't really controlled by governments. Uh, it is controlled, uh, or at least determined, much more by everyone's desire for more income uh, and companies' desire for bigger sales and bigger profits. Um, and that is driven very much by these issues of status competition uh, that intensify, as I said, the desire to consume. So in all sorts of ways, we have to reduce inequality uh, for environmental reasons and to get to a point where we can deal sensibly with these international issues. The more unequal societies are also um, more involved in conflicts and things like that. Uh, so uh, at all levels, it changes people's view of human nature so we think everyone is more out for themselves. In a more equal society, people have a rather dif different view of human nature. And that, that's because people behave differently with different levels of inequality. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. I would like to present Dr. Lee Lisa Van Sisteren, who will help introduce the speakers from now on, as well as help facilitate the roundtable. Dr. Van Sisteren has worked as a professor at Georgetown University Department of Psychiatry and as a consultant to the Central Intelligence Agency conduct, conducting psychological assessments of world leaders. Trained under former Vice President Al Gore's The Climate Project, she is an expert on the physical and mental health effects of climate change and co-authored The Psychological Effects of Global Warming in the U.S why the U.S. mental health system is not prepared. Dr. Van Sisteren. Thank you, Bandy. Um, our next speaker is Sherry Sykes. She is Senior Foreign Service Advisor to Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. She is also a career Foreign Service Officer with the U.S. Department of State, with previous diplomatic postings in Lagos, Addis Ababa, Durban, and Maputo. Most recently, she served as Deputy Director of the Office of Conservation and Water, among multiple other environmental posts. Ms. Sykes. I started off my life in high school for the arts. Um, and as an organizer, uh, I learned early that you can talk all day long, you can um, provide all of the, the, the best uh, rationale, but until people's hearts are touched, um, until people's souls are stirred, you can't touch their, their minds, much less their feet and hands. Um, and those are what's necessary. Um, as uh, Jeffrey Sachs said that uh, there, there is a, a need um, for a movement of change, a, a structural difference. Um, and that's why, um, I really appreciated the time I spent with Dr. Bandy Lee and Dr. Gary Slutkin um, with Cure Violence uh, during my sabbatical year that the Department of State gave me to go and research and look at violence so that I could come back to the Department of State and we could talk about not just peace and security, but we could, and, and, and conflict, but we could elevate the discussion to say, this isn't just a normal conflict, this is violence, um, and this is something which requires an urgency of response. Um, so I, I, I was having a conversation with Dr. Lee um, just as I was going off to Glasgow um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I uh, uh, volunteered to come back and talk a little bit about my own reflections as a uh, climate diplomat on the uh, meetings in Glasgow. Um, and so there, there are a few thoughts that I have. So let me pull those thoughts up if you don't mind. Um, so the US government uh, does recognize uh, that the urgency of the moment for climate, the, the, the large structural changes that have to happen in our economies and economies around the world um, is going to take um, drastic action. Um, it is not the business as usual 
um, of, 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 of cops where we said, okay, we've got you know, 20 years, we've got 30 years. We are now saying this is the decade. This is the decade that matters. If we don't make huge differences in the emissions around the world, especially among the G20, the top emitters, uh, we um, might as well hang up the rest of what we're trying to do in um, the, the environment. And so it is a top priority of the administration. Um, that we and as a um, uh, as a department, the Department of State, we're also working very, very hard with our um, uh, Congress to help them to understand. We are reaching out subnationally uh, to um, states, to uh, cities, mayors, um, to also help them to understand the link between uh, what we're trying to do globally and what they're doing globally and the importance of having the entire government working together um, toward these ends. Uh, so we, we announced a number of actions um, at, at this COP. Um, and I'm most proud of the fact that uh, this administration has decided that the violence that has been perpetuated by the polluters against those who have uh, who are the most vulnerable and who are who are whose economies whose societies are wreaking havoc today and are uh, set to have you know devastating consequences uh tomorrow if we even further devastating consequences tomorrow if we don't act urgently and um i don't know how many of you all are, are familiar with pepfar the president's emergency plan for aids relief um, which has made a huge difference in the lives of people all over the world, both domestically and um, certainly in the most impacted places. There were places in Uganda, for instance, that were just completely being depopulated because of HIV. And that has turned around in large measure because of this president's emergency plan for AIDS relief. Well, we're, we have every hope that this particular Congress and this particular government will also see, this administration will also see that the climate crisis um, requires a, an equivalent um, type of to the, to the needs that are, that, um, that are as close as possible to the need um, and long-term that is not something which is just one administration um, and it's called the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience, um, which is a comprehensive interagency initiative that will be the cornerstone of the US government's response to addressing the increasing impacts of the global climate crisis. It will activate a coordinated whole of government approach that will bring the United States' diplomatic development and technical expertise to help more than half a billion people in developing countries to adapt to and manage the impacts of climate change by 2030. So the notion is, this is not just something for this administration, but will go well beyond, um, because this is this is the the challenge. 2020 to 2030, what we do in this next 10 years will matter, and that that message needs to be, um, you know, propagated large everywhere. Um, at COP26, while nations were negotiating the agreement, many thousands of more people uh, were present in Glasgow and participating virtually around the world. Um, they were communicating their perspectives, they were offering solutions, they were building bridges, large and small, in literally thousands of fora over this last two week period. And this was my first COP. Um, and in speaking to other people who had been to other COPs, they said the biggest difference in this one is that the, the um, non-state actors, uh, the private sector, the um, civil society, uh, the um, youth that were present, um, the Afro-descendant communities in which I was, um, I spent some time participating in Afro-descendant work, um, the uh, indigenous communities, were far more centered and far more uh, um, part of the uh, central discussions on how are we gonna make a difference in this next 10 years. Um, 
the 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 sense of hope that was there uh, of course was um, um, dampened a bit by the fact that our Congress has not done what it needs to do. Um, but the fact that the United States as a people, as a government, um, are more present than we have been ever um, in terms of our rhetoric and our, our um, professional um, ex um, the, the fact that we have we've we've come a long way in our, our agreement that adaptation is at the core that mitigation is important but we have to do our part in adaptation um we're you know eight times more uh commitment than we've ever done before um still not enough but it's far more than we've ever done and that has is very much appreciated um of all over the the cop and did prevent pre, did present the sense that it is possible in to to prevent the, the catastrophe. We can do this um, if we all work together. Um, the 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 use of I want to, want to talk a little bit about psychology since that was one of the questions we had, and I really feel strongly as I started out that those of us who are engaged in hard discussions um, should not do those hard discussions in some sort of a, 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 a spiritual or emotional vacuum. Um, the fact that we don't take the time to center ourselves, you know, with meditation or bring music into the space, there's a certain amount of art that's present. And so there's some stimulation there. Um, but in our negotiating rooms, before we even get started, having that sense of, 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 uh, of, of spirit would really make us feel, make make those of us um, who uh, who were guided more. I mean, all of us are guided by spirit, but I think many more cultures around the world um, uh, need understand that you can't start a conversation just with you know testing mic one two three testing mic two one two three talk. And um, uh, so I'm, I, our next cop will be in Egypt. It will be an, an African cop. And there are many of us who are talking about how do we make sure that the conversations and the spirit of those conversations um, are grounded um, in, in uh, more than just words, but also um, in, 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 a, uh, in the sensory and in the spiritual uh, that comes from the sensory. So I'll leave it at that. And um, uh, I'll be glad to take questions. And thank you, thank you very much for including me in this conversation. Thank you, Ms. Sykes. All right, next is Dr. Peter Kuznick. He's professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. He is co-author with Akira Kimura of Rethinking the Atomic Bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He's founder of American University's Nuclear Studies Institute. He and Oliver Stone co-authored the 10-part Showtime documentary film series and book titled The Untold History of the United States. Dr. Kuznick. Thank you, Lisa. And thanks, Bandy, for inviting me. Um, Bandy started off by talking about the doomsday clock, which the Bulletin Atomic Scientists introduced in 1947. In 1953, they moved the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight. That was after the US and the Soviets tested their hydrogen bomb or prototype hydrogen bomb in the Soviet case. And it didn't move to two minutes before midnight again until 2018 in the aftermath of the near war between the US and North Korea. And in 2020, it became was moved to 100 seconds before midnight. I think it's time to move the hands closer now. Uh, we're in a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, I started the week doing interviews on Chinese TV about the Xi Biden summit with particular focus on the crisis in Taiwan that Jeffrey was talking about. I ended the week by doing interviews, several interviews on Russian TV about the Ukraine crisis. Uh, in both cases, we're talking about approaching war and military confrontation. Both are very dangerous, very alarming. Uh, Biden has done a pretty good job 
differentiating himself from Trump when it comes to domestic policy. Uh, but he's done a terrible job when it comes to foreign policy. In fact, Biden has doubled down on, on Trump's foreign policy in the same way that he's legitimized it, in the same way that Obama legitimized so much of Bush's policies, uh, Biden is legitimizing and doubling down on a lot of Trump's policies. And uh, it's creating, a, and I, maybe it's not that surprising, when George W. Bush took over, he brought in a lot of people, the neocons from the Project for New American Century, flooded into the Bush administration. They gave us Afghanistan, they gave us Iraq and other military adventures. Uh, with the Biden administration, we've seen 16 members of the Center for New American Security flood into the Biden administration. These are the super hawks. This is people like Kurt Campbell and Jake Sullivan. The people who gave us the Asia pivot under Obama are now there making policy. And their influence, especially when it comes to China and Russia, has been very, very dangerous. Um, Jeffrey mentioned that the United States has been diverting from its one, the one, accepting the one China policy that maintained stability in the region for so long. We've seen this beginning under Biden uh, and, and again worsening under, uh, beginning under Trump and worsening under Biden. Uh, we could say that it starts with the 2016 victory by Tse and her Democratic Progress Party and they're uh, staking out an increasingly independent role vis-a-vis -vis China. And what we've seen the U.S. doing recently, sending warships into the South China Sea in the Strait of Taiwan, uh, announcing that U.S. Marines and Special Forces have been training Taiwan's military. Uh, Biden's statement that the U.S. would come to Taiwan's defense, which is not what America's official policy has been, uh, the recent AUKUS deal with uh, uh, Australia and the United Kingdom, uh, where we're selling nuclear subs to Australia. Uh, again, polarizing that situation in a very dangerous way. The Chinese responding in kind, sending 150 warplanes into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. The situation there has been heating up in a very dangerous way. Uh, but in the, in the last few days, Taiwan has fallen from the headlines, and now they're focusing more on Belarus and Ukraine. And we look, for example, I picked up the, looked at today's Washington Post and New York Times, look at the headlines, the Washington Post headline, Putin is testing US, NATO with buildup along Russia-Ukraine border, defense minister says, Washington Post, amid tension with Russia, White House scrutinizes military exercises in Europe. New York Times, on Putin's strategic chessboard, a series of destabilizing moves. Uh, Putin's speech to the foreign ministry on Thursday warned that the US and NATO are, quote, escalating the situation by supplying Kiev with lethal modern weapons and conducting provocative maneuvers in the Black Sea and flying nuclear capable bombers 20 kilometers from our border, 12 miles from the Russian border. He says that we're crossing Russia's red lines. Again, very, very dangerous. Uh, the US says it's gonna to come to Ukraine's defense also. Clearly, if there's a war in the region, the Russians are much more powerful. The Russians will be able to prevail in a war against Ukraine, even with US and NATO support in the region. So far as Taiwan, the Pentagon has conducted 18 war games Judge uh, uh, U.S. against China, and China has won all 18 war games over Taiwan. And so what is the U.S. recourse? Do we accept defeat in those two areas, or does the U.S. resort to the nuclear weapons, which would be the only thing the U.S. could do to prevail in either conflict? And this gets me to what I was going to talk about today, and that's uh, the insanity of the nuclear era. Uh, and, and this has been with us since 1945, when American leaders understood that they were beginning a process with the dropping of the atomic bombs that could end to the elimination of life on the planet. Oppenheimer, in, on May 31st, 
warned the military and political leaders at the interim committee meeting. He said that within three years, we'll likely have weapons between 700 and 7,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. 700, 7,000 times as powerful. Truman understood this on at least three separate occasions. He said, we're not building a bigger, more powerful bomb. We're uh, threatening to end life on the planet. When he got the briefing at Potsdam of how powerful the Trinity test was in Almogordo, he wrote in his journal, uh, we've discovered the most terrible weapon in history. This may be the fire destruction prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. Not a more powerful bomb, the fire destruction. And that's exact. And this was, we used the bomb in that occasion, even though uh, we knew that it wasn't necessary. Seven of America's eight five star admirals and generals in 1945 were on the record saying that the atomic bombs were either militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. It wasn't the bombs that ended the war. That's the big myth that Susan Rice wrote about in the New York Times, that Obama doubled down on when he was in Hiroshima. The idea that the bombs ended the war and they were actually humane because they saved not only a half million American lives that have been lost in an invasion, but millions of Japanese lives. Complete lie. But that's what the kids grow up uh, reading about and learning about in the schools, what most Americans still believe. Uh, and I can go into detail if we have some time. But, uh, and then the, the insanity continues with the development of the hydrogen bomb in 1950. Eisenhower, people know Eisenhower for his warnings about the military industrial complex. Well, yeah, he warned about it. He knows about it because he created it. When Eisenhower took office, we had about a thousand nuclear weapons. When he left office, we had 22,000 nuclear weapons. When his budgeting cycle was finished, we had 30,000 nuclear weapons. When he took office, we had one finger on the nuclear button. When he left office with delegation and subdelegation, we had dozens of fingers on the nuclear button. When he took office, nuclear weapons were our last resort. When he left office, they were our first resort if any war with the Soviet Union. But the Insanity continued during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and during which Kennedy and Khrushchev both understood that they had lost control, and that in any conflict like this that develops, that there is no way to actually maintain control, which is why Khrushchev wrote that letter to Kennedy after the crisis, saying that our people have felt the flames of thermonuclear war. Let's eliminate every conflict between us that could lead to another crisis like this. And they tried to do that for the next year after the Cuban Missile Crisis. When I take my students to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which I've been doing every year since 1995, before the pandemic hit, I would always find myself in the Atomic Bomb Museum in Hiroshima, writing down the same information, that by 1985, the world had accumulated the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. How crazy were we? How many times do we have to be able to end life on the planet over again and over before we're satisfied. Even crazier, in 1954, there were actual congressional hearings about Project Sundial. That was the idea to build one nuclear weapon that would be 700,000 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. And the military and the scientific leaders were actually thinking about how to do that and having serious hearings on that. The current situation, Sagan and the other scientists in the 1980s who were talking about nuclear winter actually underestimated the effects of nuclear war. What we know now is that even a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan, which 100 nuclear Hiroshima-sized nuclear bombs would were be used, would send 10 million tons of smoke and soot into the atmosphere. It would circle the stratosphere within two weeks, block the sun's rays, from hitting the Earth's surface, destroy much of the agriculture on a freezing Earth, and lead to up to 2 billion deaths from 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons between India and Pakistan. We have over 13,000 nuclear weapons. Uh, they're not Hiroshima-sized. They're between seven, seven and uh, 70 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb for the most part. What, so even if a tiny fraction of the nuclear weapons were used, and in this escalated situation, 
This would be the consequence. But all nine nuclear powers are modernizing their nuclear arsenals, led by the United States, which is spending 1.7 trillion to modernize to make our nuclear weapons more efficient and more lethal. So Biden has said he wants to adopt a no first use policy uh, in his new nuclear posture review, but all the evidence indicates that he's not gonna be doing that. In the aftermath of that botched withdrawal from Afghanistan, he's under enormous pressure to look strong again. And, with, and there's bipartisan support for a hard line from uh, over militarized policies, Democrats and Republicans, uh, a lot of pressure from the Hawks and given the international situation now, I think there's almost no chance that Biden is going to follow through on that. But it's not just the United States. Russia is modernizing. Uh, uh, Putin's March 1st, 2018 State of the Nation address said that Russia has now developed five new nuclear weapons, all of which can circumvent U.S. missile defense. We've got this, uh, all this discussion of hypersonic weapons coming online. The Pentagon reported last week that China plans to increase its nuclear arsenal, or two weeks ago, China plans to increase its nuclear arsenal from about 300 to 1,000 nuclear weapons by the end of the decade. Britain has announced that it's going to increase its nuclear arsenal by 40%. So instead of going in the direction of sanity, a direction of disarmament, of making the world safer, we are now in a situation where the world is getting more and more dangerous. And I think about those New York Times ads that same took out back in 1957 and 58. Full page ad, Dr. Spock is worried. Well, we need to start waking people up to the threats we're facing again. Uh, next is Dr. Kenneth Benedict, a University of Chicago lecturer and senior fellow of its Energy Policy Institute. She is a former executive director and publisher of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Before joining the Bulletin, she was director of international peace and security at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, where she also served as senior advisor to the president, working to promote international peace and security. Dr. Benedict. Thank you very much, Lisa, for that uh, introduction. And I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today uh, and talk about nuclear violence. Um, uh, several people have mentioned the doomsday clock and Peter just suggested that we should move the hand closer to midnight. Um, it has been a symbol that has helped uh, raise awareness around the world. And not only does it include uh, nuclear violence, but also uh, starting in 2008, we added climate change to the clock. So it's, uh, it's uh, uh, comprehensive. Um, the scientists who developed the first atomic bombs understood the destructive power of the nuclear fission they had released. And in the 1946 edited volume that Dr. Lee referred to, One World or None, scientists who had worked on the Manhattan Project forecasted the end of civilization if nuclear weapons were used in war, as Peter just remarked. They were most worried at the time about the Soviet Union and the United States, but they understood that the bomb could not be kept secret, that other countries would acquire them, and if used in war, could bring about unimaginable destruction. But in addition to the technical aspects of the bomb, they also discussed the dangers of nationalism and fear. They saw clearly that without international control of nuclear material and technology, nuclear arms races would be our future. And even Edward Teller, father of the hydrogen bomb, in a 1946 issue of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, called for world government to regulate and restrain the development of nuclear energy and weapons. Now, there's no question that today, the leading nuclear armed countries are engaged in a new arms race, as Peter detailed. The United States, Russia, China, the United Kingdom, and France are all bent on modernizing and increasing their stocks of nuclear weapons. India, Pakistan, and North Korea are also building up their arsenals. With renewed reliance by these countries on nuclear weapons, the world faces two existential threats to human survival, nuclear weapons and climate change. And while climate change is receiving much more attention these days, at last, there are still over 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world, the vast majority of them in the United States and Russia. 2,000 are on high alert and ready to use in minutes. Should even as few as 100 of these weapons be used in war, entire cities would be laid waste, 
and humanitarian relief and medical organizations would be overwhelmed by the damage to people and places. In addition, as Peter pointed out, the soot from the fires set off by nuclear weapons explosions would rise, cooling the Earth's atmosphere by several degrees, resulting in agricultural collapse and worldwide famine for nearly a decade. But perhaps most daunting for our discussion today is that nuclear weapons doctrines are stuck in nationalist mindsets that insist these destructive weapons are necessary to deter another country from attacking. Nuclear weapons are thought to provide military security, so states are unlikely to disarm unilaterally, claiming that doing so would leave them vulnerable to attack. So to make our world safe from nuclear catastrophe, Nuclear disarmament, like climate change, must be addressed with concerted action and international cooperation. So what are the prospects uh, of cooperation? Uh, states have come together in the past to enact treaties that limited the spread of nuclear weapons while encouraging the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. The Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty of 1968 was ratified by nearly all states while this agreement has restrained the spread of nuclear weapons beyond the original five, the United States, Russia, France, the UK, and China, the unfulfilled promise of the NPT of disarmament by the nuclear armed states leaves those countries that have refrained from developing their own arsenals bitterly disappointed. So the hypocrisy of the NPT and inaction by nuclear weapon states have prompted non-nuclear weapon states in the last seven to 10 years, led by Norway, Mexico, and Austria, by Nigeria, South Africa, and Brazil, among others, along with civil society organizations, including the International Committee of the Red Cross, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons to draw up and ratify a UN treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. This treaty calls on all states to renounce nuclear weapons and delegitimize them as instruments of national security. For its efforts, ICANN received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Over 50 countries have ratified the country, the, sorry, the treaty, which entered into force last January, 2021. Now, while the ban treaty is not supported by any of the nuclear weapons states or their allies, it does set out a principled vision of a world that recognizes the horrible harms caused by nuclear weapons in what's called a humanitarian approach to security. It places human beings rather than states at the center of security policy and calls on people and their leaders to delegitimize and disinvest in nuclear weapons. So far, hundreds of cities and localities around the world from Asia to Europe to Latin America including over 50 cities in the United States, most prominently Los Angeles, Des Moines and Washington DC, and four states, California, Oregon, New Jersey and Maine, have adopted resolutions supporting this treaty. Organizers of these efforts support public discussions of the treaty to raise awareness about the ongoing dangers and provide tools for the public to insist on financial disinvestment in manufacturing weapons of catastrophic destruction. This is a bright spot in the otherwise miserable state of world affairs we find ourselves in, but I, I hope it provides a starting point for discussion and for organization. Uh, it doesn't get much attention in the press, but it does offer an opportunity to raise public awareness and mobilize citizens to act in their own interests to rid the world of the most dangerous technology on earth. Uh, Roundtable discussions are for the panelists to be able to respond to one another. Unfortunately, we'll have to ask you to keep your responses brief. Uh, since Dr. Sachs is still with us, uh, we can start with him. So uh, Lisa, please go ahead. Well, uh, being a psychiatrist, uh, this isn't gonna come as a news flash, but obviously the themes that we're talking about uh, are, are not new uh, to human nature. We're self-destructive, we're irrational uh, as, uh, as, a, as a species, and we're very fearful. And I will add that when people are fearful, and I think this dominates us more than we realize, we regress 
And when we regress, it brings out our more primitive emotions, sometimes acting out angrily. And we are also subject to the uh, willing uh, exchange of cherished values for the promise of security. And this usually comes from a bully or a strong man. So my greatest fear right now is the decay of democracy, because I feel that all of the things that we have talked about today uh, can be traced back to an erosion of the democracy that we originally envisioned. So I would like to push that out, uh, and not just as a statement about as a warning, but is there a new kind of leadership? And I'm not anti-men by any uh, a stretch of the imagination. I'm more inclined, in fact, than that uh, uh, arena. But I wonder if a matriarchal society is something that we need to look at in terms of a more collaborative approach. So throwing that out, uh, brought up a couple of themes. I know we don't have much time, but uh, thank you, Bandy, and thank you all for a very, very uh, stimulating discussion. Every, uh, every person that spoke spoke uh, brilliantly. Uh, this is a very rich discussion, so I'm very grateful to have heard the comments. I want to say one word about inequality and violence, a little bit different from what has been discussed. And that is to have the degree of inequality that we have in the United States requires violent suppression of poor people. So it's not only that inequality creates conditions where people respond to violence. Our society is a society that has been violently suppressing even genocidally killing uh, minorities throughout our history, because you cannot have an open society that would maintain this level of inequality. The only way that you have this level of inequality is to lock up young African-Americans, to uh, have the kind of vigilantism, uh, to have state-sponsored vigilantism, so the violence that we see in unequal societies is, is as uh, Professor Wilkerson uh, and uh, Professor Gilligan said so brilliantly, part of the social psychological response, but it's also part of the power response. If we were a normal, open, honest society, we would take measures to reduce inequality. It requires voter suppression, violence, killing, mass incarceration to maintain this degree of inequality, which is completely abnormal in an open society. So that's a point that I wanted to emphasize. A second point is that we already have in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the commitment to nuclear disarmament. So I am completely in favor of uh, the uh, banning nuclear weapons, but we haven't, an even more direct approach because we are signatories to the non-proliferation treaty and we are violating it every day. And so I think that this is uh, also from an advocacy and a legal point of view, an important point to stress. We're bound by it, not for a treaty that we haven't signed, but for a treaty that we signed decades ago. And the third point uh, that I wanted to underscore uh, that I appreciate Peter Kuznick uh, pointing out uh, very powerfully is the provenance of this administration's foreign policy staff. Just like, and he said it exactly right, just like the Bush administration was staffed by a group of neocons from a common project, this administration is staffed by a group of neocons from a common project. This is not well known. And it should be said, Mr. Biden, you did not appoint a representative group of foreign policy leaders. You appointed the Democratic Party's group of neocons. And this is endangering America. We need to open up our foreign policy, not just to trading off their neocons versus our neocons, but actually for people who don't believe in this nationalistic approach. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for a fabulous discussion. I, I, the only thing I think I can add from my own particular perspective is um, that I think one of the main causes of the anti-democratic uh, politics 
that we see today, uh, especially in the Republican Party, although as uh, Dr. Sachs and, and others on the panel have, have mentioned, um, that's often, all too often been imitated uh, to some degree by the, by the Democratic Party. But I think one of the main causes of this is the wish that people feel, people in power feel, to prove to the world that they are superior, uh, that they uh, uh, have more power, more prestige, uh, and, and are, mo are more entitled uh, than other people. And uh, they will absolutely go out of their way to enforce the status inequalities and hierarchies, which actually stimulate both individual and collective violence. I mean, I've, I've emphasized the role of, of shame and humiliation as increasing individual violence, like murder and suicide. But let me remind you that Hitler came to power and led to you know, the deadliest war in human history and, and genocide on a previously unknown scale. He came to power on the campaign promise to undo the shame of Versailles, the Versailles Peace Treaty, which he felt, and many Germans who following him felt, had dishonored and shamed the whole country of Germany. Uh, second example, the first public comment that Osama bin Laden made after the events of 9-11 was that uh, those attacks on the US were payback for what he called 80 years of humiliation and contempt, that he said the entire Islamic nation had uh, been subjected to uh, 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 for the past 80 years by uh, basically by the nations of uh, Western civilization of which the US was the main example. Uh, in our own political life, uh, both presidents Johnson and Nixon kept the United States in, in an unnecessary and futile and deadly violent war in Vietnam because of their fear that they would lose face if they became the first president to admit defeat in a war. I mean, again, the fear of shame and disgrace and dishonor and of being treated as inferior and so forth. So I, I again, I just wanna say I am honored and, and enormously uh, stimulated by the, uh, the, the brilliance of uh, the other participants in this uh, discussion. And I thank you for uh, organizing this, Pandey. Thank you. Uh it's those feelings, what inequality does is increase those feelings of superiority at the top and inferiority at the bottom, and the fear that the people at the top have of the people at the bottom. So incarceration is extraordinarily closely related to inequality, both across American states and internationally. Uh, the more inequality, the more you feel you have to suppress the people at the bottom because you know they're a threat and a danger, and the less empathy you have for them, uh, empathy goes down with inequality. Um, but on uh, the point uh, about um, that Lisa raised about um, women leaders, uh, there is now good evidence not only that more equal societies have done better on COVID. Uh, fewer deaths, uh, less cases and so on, but also that societies led by women, with women presidents or prime ministers have done better. I think more equal societies are more likely to elect women and I think more equal societies are more likely to be matriarchal. Um, I really hope that um, we can um take some time to meet with some of my colleagues who are at our Foreign Service Institute um, and see what we might do as our uh, diplomats are being trained, um, either when they first come in um, or in subsequent uh, development to learn more on these concepts, more on the um, uh, causes of conflict and the causes of, of, of the problems that we're trying to unravel um, through our work, um, you know, inequality and, uh, and so forth. And, I, and, and there's not nearly enough conversations um, that would enable us to uh, 
put a, a different analytical lens on uh, than what we normally get in our normal, you know, poli sci courses um, and, in college. And, um, uh, you know, for instance, I was in South Africa for six years. And after uh, my time with you all and studying James Gilligan and others, <laughs> and I, I um, went back and I was the consul general in Durban and I said, there's, we come from one of the most unequal societies in the world. South Africa is in its own income band, the most unequal society in the world. There are so many similarities. Um, there's so much that we have in common, which makes it, it should make it easier for us to have discussions about how to improve things for the South African people and for the American people, but without that knowledge, without that perspective, like most of my colleagues were like, what are you talking about? You know, how, how you know, the, the problem is that, you know, they have this problem and they have that problem and, and, and we don't have those problems, we have the solutions. And, and so there's a, uh, there, there's this orientation, which um, I think many of the contributors here could bring that I think would be useful. So I'm, I, I'd like to uh, suggest that we have a follow-up. Um, there are some colleagues who are at the Foreign Service Institute who are looking for new ways to um, get at uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, that's, that's, that's all the talk. And if you're going to do diversity, equity, and inclusion, that means we have to think about new ways of approaching and thinking about our problems. The second thing I'd like to talk about is um, this is 2021. No one would ever consider having a mantle, right? I say from now on, we will never ever consider having something where a good proportion of the panelists are not under 30. Um, I, a big part of what we're missing, I think in our discourse is the need for cultural revolution, the need for bringing more young people into every conversation, every discussion, every action agenda. Uh, if we're gonna fund something, if we're gonna implement, are we doing that with people under 30? Um, I, that, those are the folks, we have the wisdom, we, <laughs> you know, those of us over 50, you know, we have lots of wisdom, uh, but we need more balance. Uh, we need to uh, balance wisdom of the elders with the energy and passion of young people. And um, I just, that's my final thought. Thank you. I actually did a Russian TV interview yesterday about the politics of Gen Z, you know, the 18 to 24 year olds. And they sent me this article they wanted me to comment on about how ignorant Gen Z is, that they know a lot of, they can identify figures in video games, but they don't know any history. Uh, now, there is some truth to the fact they don't know a lot of history, but their ignorance does not lead them to be indifferent or apathetic. They actually are very sensitive to the issues we're talking about today, and especially uh, inequality. Uh, Jeffrey started the conversation about the gap between rich and poor and the dangers of plutocracy, and that's really a serious, serious problem as we all understand the insanity of a world in which the richest eight people have more wealth than the poorest four billion people, or in the United States, the richest three people have more wealth than the lower half of the population. I mean, this how who could design such a world? They were we have had a lot of times when we could have avoided this world. We could have avoided it after World War II. Had Henry Wallace become president instead of Harry Truman back in 1945, when Roosevelt died on April 12th, we would have had a very different world. And if you know the story, you know, what the Democratic Convention, uh, the day it began, July 20th, 1944, Gallup released a poll asking voters, potential voters, who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 65% said they wanted Wallace back as vice president. 2% wanted Harry Truman. And somehow the Democratic Convention was so book, so fixed that Truman got the nomination. Although had Claude Pepper gotten five more feet to the microphone, Wallace would have gotten the nomination before they adjourned that first night. But I won't go to that part. But, but since I'm mentioning Wallace, I, uh, and Lisa talked about fear, I want to read something, a speech that Wallace, a little from a speech that Wallace gave on the anniversary of Roosevelt's death, in which he says, 
And this is and Wallace stayed in the cabinet as Secretary of Commerce and did everything he could to prevent the nuclear arms race in the Cold War for a year until Truman fired him. And he says the only kind of competition we want with the Soviets is to demonstrate that we can raise our standard of living faster during the next 20 years than Russia. We shall compete with Russia in serving the spiritual and physical needs of the common man. The only way to defeat communism in the world is to do a better and smoother job of maximum production and optimum distribution. Let's make it a clean race, a determined race, but above all, a peaceful race in the service of humanity. Um, it goes on and says, the source of all our mistakes is fear. Russia fears Anglo-Saxon encirclement. We fear communist penetration. If these fears continue, the day will come when our sons and grandsons will pay for these fears with rivers of blood. Out of, out of fear, great nations have been acting like cornered beasts, thinking only of survival. Then he went on to criticize Churchill's Iron Curtain speech. But uh, these, these divisions that we're facing now, and, and it's what I was trying to, the point I was trying to get across during my talk is it's getting worse and it's getting worse by the day. And both, all sides are doubling down. Some of us have been writing about the way in which the bomb, the nuclear bomb, has contributed quite a bit to the erosion of that democracy. Um, in the United States, one person, the president, has the ability to commit genocide worldwide uh, with really no participation by Congress, no participation by the public, no public deliberation. And in a way, the bomb itself has, in a sense, infantilized uh, the citizens of the United States and infantilized, I suppose, other countries as well. Uh, it's really the greatest inequality you can imagine. One person with the ability to uh, bring about the destruction of the planet. So when we speak about erosion of democracy, there are many causes, and all of you have talked about the growing inequality, the suppression of the vote, uh, but I'd suggest that we as a country have a suppressed citizen rights and voices, at least since 1945 and the development of the atomic bomb. Uh, it's a, it's an, uh, an idea that not many are interested in pursuing because the nuclear priesthood keeps its secrets and wants us to be kept in the dark. Uh, but I think it's time now uh, to uh, question that those stances, to question the secrecy that we experience every day, and to question the authority, the sole authority of one human being to bring about such destruction. Um, that also, I think, has contributed to the erosion of democracy in the United States. In the interest of supporting solutions and commenting on what you just said, Kanet, which is obviously very, very interesting. Uh, we don't have a feeling, a perception anymore that it is one person, one vote. And it has come as a result of some efforts. Uh, of course, gerrymandering is at the top, uh, along with the belief that you can buy a person's vote. Uh, and indeed, the fact that you can trade uh, your vote for money. Uh, and with that comes the apathy and the humiliation, frankly, that you don't count. So I really see all of our efforts as needing to be focused in addition to everything else we are doing to working directly to address the issues that are fundamental to the decay of our democracy, the gerrymandering, which is polarizing our uh, elected officials, the, the quid pro quo of money for vote, and the, uh, uh, the, accumula or the cumulative uh, resulting toll of a feeling of apathy, insignificance, and anger. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Dr. Van Sisteren for those important words. And we're now well past our allotted time. Uh, we have been um, extraordinarily grateful for, for, for your contributions to this critical discussion. Uh, we've been very honored uh, and grateful for your time.